Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is our National Donor Sabbath webinar, which is a part of our patient ambassador program here at the Chris Kluck Foundation, or just CKF for short. My name is Cece Cunningham, and I am the executive director of the Chris Kluck Foundation. And um, today I'll be sort of going over this and moderating this panel with you guys. So if you are new to Zoom webinar, that's the platform we're using today. Um, you'll notice that you have a Q&A box to field any questions to the panelists um, on your console. So we are going to have a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, and we really encourage you to type any questions that may come to mind throughout the, throughout the entire um, presentation you know, today. Um, type those questions into the Q&A and not the chat, um, you know, just as they come to mind, and we'll get to them at the very end of the presentation. So first, I would like to thank our very generous sponsor and good friends at the Hearts for Rust Foundation for their support in making this webinar series possible possible. Um, I'd also like to thank it and introduce our presenting partner, two-time kidney transplant recipient and CKF patient ambassador, Sarah Millard. Hello, my name is Sarah Millard. I'm a two-time kidney transplant recipient and a patient ambassador for the Chris Kluge Foundation. I'm also a student at Calvin Theological Seminary in the pastoral care program. Today's webinar is National Donor Sabbath. So come along with us and our panel of guests as we discuss the faith journey, dispel myths about organ donation, and live life, give life. Awesome. So that's Sarah. She's helping us out today um, with our National Donor Sabbath webinar. And just to give you some background, you know, National Donor Sabbath is observed annually two weekends before Thanksgiving from Friday through Sunday. So it's coming up this month, um, November 12th through the 14th this weekend. So it's a three-day observance, and it seeks to include the days of worship for major religions practiced in the United States. Um, during National Donor Sabbath, faith leaders from many religions, donor families, transplant recipients, um, through donation and transplantation, um, also professionals in that field, they participate in services and programs to really educate the public about the need for the life-saving and healing gifts passed to others through transplantation, while also encouraging people to register their decision to be organ, eye, and tissue donors. So, you know, giving the gift of life is a very personal decision. One factor that might affect your decision is, you know, your faith. So that's really what we're calling attention to today. Um, when someone we know passes away, it can really emphasize the importance of the spiritual aspect of life and our spirituality. So when you're faced with this decision of organ and tissue donation during this whole sort of event of, you know, the trauma of a loved one's death, um, a person's religion suddenly, you know, becomes very important or may become very important. So um, we really try to focus on the aspects of spirituality and religion, um, while also sort of dispelling the myths um, that kind of cir circulate around organ donation and and um, this is our first ever National Donor Sabbath webinar, and we're kicking off this event um, today, and we're really excited to introduce our panelists to you. So I will introduce, first up, we have Rabbi Rick Brody. Rabbi Rick Brody is the Baskin Jewish Community Chaplain at Jewish Family Service of Colorado, a position he began shortly after moving to Colorado in the middle of 2018. Rabbi Rick serves the spiritual and pastoral needs of unaffiliated Jews throughout the greater Denver area, on call for emergencies and available for scheduled visits to hospitals, hospices, homes, skilled nursing facilities, independent living and retirement communities, et cetera. He has served in congregations, schools, and other institutions across the United States, including Los Angeles, Austin, and the Delaware Valley. Rabbi Rick has been a proud supporter of organ donation and has worked with other organizations previously to raise awareness of the need for organ donation. He also has two children, aged 17 and 13. Thanks for being here today, Rick. And then we have Reverend Bill Lepfer. The Reverend Dr. Will, William Lepfer has been serving Episcopal parishes for the past three decades in Chicago, Detroit, Portland, Oregon, New York City, Phoenix, and Aspen, Colorado. Prior to parish ministry, he served in the criminal justice system in Bridgeport, Connecticut for five years. Before that, he led a wide variety of wilderness adventure trips for young people. He actually met God while doing a three-day solo on the Missinibe River in, in Canada when he was 15. So he was raised in Chicago before marrying his wife Kimiko Koga in 1990, who is from Tokyo, and they have two wonderful children together. Thanks for joining us today, Reverend. 
Next, we have Rabbi Mendel Mintz. He is a prominent member of the Aspen community. In 2000, he and his wife, Leva Mintz, moved to Aspen and have been blessed with six children. Mendel knew he wanted to be a spiritual leader and attended the Oholai Torah after school. Mendel later founded the Chabad Jewish Community Center, which aims to bring Aspen's Jewish community together through the JCC. Mendel teaches a Hebrew language reading course, as well as uh, running a number of communal events throughout the year. Um, that said, we also have a very special guest joining us today who I'd like to introduce now. Um, his name is Brian Harris. He is a former Denver Broncos uh, football player, and he is an avid supporter of organ donation after seeing the impact he had, uh, it had on his family when his father, father's life was uh, saved by the gift of organ donation. Ryan is a practicing Muslim and takes the time to campaign to get an increase in the number of Muslim organ donors across the United States. Ryan is a Super Bowl 50 champion, as well as 10 years veteran of the NFL. He was drafted to the Denver Broncos before playing for the Houston Texans, the Kansas City Chiefs, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Hello, everyone. I am Ryan Harris, and thank you for joining the National Donor Sabbath webinar. This is a huge topic to myself and, and thousands of others in our country. My father, thankfully, has been able to receive two kidney transplants, the latest from my wife's father in a kidney transplant match program. And it's incredible for all of us to, it's incredibly important for all of us to continue to spread the message that even though we are full of faith and have our religions, that each of the major religions do allow for organ, eye, and tissue donation. We have the opportunity to affect multiple lives, some, sometimes as many as 30 or 40 at a time. So I highly encourage everyone to continue to be an advocate for those who need organ, eye, and tissue donation. Uh, and I know firsthand how much it means when someone you love receives an organ that allows them to return to normal life. So thank you for being here today. I encourage you to continue to have conversations with others to spread the word and knowledge that we are allowed to, to use organ eye, and kin, organ, eye, and tissue donation to support others and to give life to those who are suffering. Thank you so much. See you soon. Yeah, so the, these are our panelists today, and we're so thankful to everyone for being here today. Um, just to give you a little background into what the Chris Klug Foundation does, we're a national nonprofit organization. We're based in Aspen, Colorado, um, and we educate people on and advocate for organ, eye, and tissue donation. So our main goal at CKF is to eliminate the wait for people on the transplant wait list. Um, and really, our number one priority is to equip people, you know, mostly young people, with the core facts of organ donation. So when they are faced with that decision to register as organ donors, they are fully informed and they can make the decision that they're comfortable with and know a lot about. So with that being said, um, I'm going to jump into some questions now. Um, my first one I'd like to direct to the Reverend Bill. Um, just to get things started, you know, Obviously, scripture plays a huge role in um, religion and especially in Christianity. And speaking about the Bible, you know, is there a biblical perspective on organ donation? And if so, what does the Bible say uh, regarding organ donation or just the concept of, you know, receiving life from someone else? So I'll talk about the Christian scriptures and let my rabbi friends talk about the Hebrew scriptures. In Christian scriptures, the whole Scripture is centered on the story of Jesus who gives his body and his life so that others might have life. So within the Christian tradition, organ donation, frankly, is not very controversial. It comes, uh, the rationale for it comes right out of the saving act that Jesus did for Christians. And uh, it could be summed up in the love commandment where Jesus says, all the commandments are basically this, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And then, you know, Jesus shows us by example, self-giving love. And so organ donation fits right within that. And that's really all I have to say. It's, it's, it's part of our story and supported right. by the example of Jesus. Right, right. And it's, it's really incredible um, that there's that seems to be a common thread. And speaking on that, rabbis Rick and Mendel, um, you know, are there similar perspectives on organ do donation within the Jewish scripture, within the Torah? Um, and if so, what are they? I'll start. Um, uh, so it is probably worth pointing out explicitly that 
the idea of actually giving a part of one's body to someone else's body in the literal medical way that we're discussing today is not something that was known or considered consciously by our biblical forebears. Uh, ancient Jews were not aware of these opportunities. So what is then incumbent upon us is to look at the values that are expressed in our texts and discern from them what would be the most appropriate application of those values to the situations that we find ourselves in. Uh, I would say that uh, what Reverend Bill shared about the Christian perspective uh, resonates very similarly looking at the Hebrew scriptures and the Jewish biblical perspective. As he was speaking, I thought about the core teaching that comes from Deuteronomy, you shall love the eternal with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Those different uh, words can get translated in different ways and understood differently, but the core idea behind uh, a pretty mainstream understanding is that we put all of ourselves into what it means to love God. And of course, the understanding is that the best way to show our love for God is to be giving and loving and supportive of life for those around us. So therefore, any way that we can give of ourselves which again, wasn't necessarily thought of in that same literal way that we mean when we're giving a part of our bodies to sustain life, to save another person. Uh, but then all the more so when we do have that opportunity is such a beautiful manifestation of that idea of loving God, loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving our fellow human beings and supporting life. Mendel, do you have anything to add or... Yes, yeah, sure. First of all, thank you, CC, and thank you for everything you and the Chris Klug Foundation does to better humanity and society and giving so many people uh, opportunities, frankly, to live longer and celebrate life. And it's a real blessing what the foundation does uh, in the community and the whole world. So thank you. I think, you know, after listening to the Reverend and Rabbi Rick, I think there's so much in common with all the religions when it comes to something like this, because fundamentally at the core, and it's mentioned many places in Judaism, the whole purpose of the Torah was to perpetuate life, to give life, to live life, and what greater gift, what greater meaningful act that one can do in a lifetime than give someone else the gift of life. I can speak for a man, I guess I can never have children on my own, but it, it sounds like literally giving birth. Uh, creating and giving someone life. And I think there's no greater concept. So while biblically, it may not be mentioned specifically, uh, certainly, uh, and that's why, by the way, it wasn't because the sages of old simply didn't have the ability to recognize and see the future and the advancement, perhaps in, in such a great way, and the blessings we have medically in currently in our society, uh, but it's fundamental and foundational and a Jewish concept that if you can give life to someone, I can't think of anything greater. Yeah, there definitely is, um, you know, it's it's hard not to notice the, um, like I said, the common thread that runs between um, seemingly all major religions um, in terms of morality and doing good. Um, and Mendel, I wanted to um, go a little bit deeper into, you know, um, the Hebrew texts and Jewish scripture, you know, there is a lot of, you know, death and the definition of death itself really is quite complex within the Jewish faith. So this complexity, that's sort of where the myth surrounding, um, uh, you know, being unable to donate organs or to, um, and also goes with it, the mutilation of the body and things that sort of relate to this complex definition of death. Um, this complexity really seems to generate some confusion within the Jewish community around the concept of organ donation. <clears throat> so just uh, wondering if you can explain a little more in detail, you know, the concept of death and how this sort of relates to organ donation. 
Of course. So I think my colleagues here will be able to add to this as well, because there's so many perspectives. So I think first and foremost, the historical concept of mutilation and so on, which all of us would agree today from, you know, those who are stand behind fully organ donation to those who find challenges or complications or problems with it, that wasting or not use, making the most of it is problematic. Uh, and all of us agree to that. That's obvious. That doesn't even have to be stated. But when you have the ability to give life, and when I say give life from a Jewish and Torah perspective, certainly, and I'm assuming this applies to all religions to a, a similar or some degree, even prolonging life for seconds in Judaism has great value. 5, 10, 15 seconds, let alone weeks, months, and years that organ donation has proven to show. So there's a concept called pikuach nefesh, when life is at stake, when one's life is at stake, we pause everything. There isn't any commandment that comes before that. There isn't anything that needs to be done prior. You drop whatever you do it. The most important thing in the world, whatever that may be doing, whatever, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity which some people don't even ever have the opportunity to do, to do something bigger and larger than themselves. And I think, uh, going back to, again, to what Rick mentioned before, while historically there was concern and fear and mutilation and respect for the deceased or what's going to happen to a body and all good concerns and all legitimate concerns, but it was for a very different concept and a very different reason. It was for a lack of respect to a human being, which is a holy human being created by God and the parents. Uh, but when it's something to continue life, these are gifts that God gave us. If God didn't want it to happen, we wouldn't have the ability to share a kidney or tissue and so on. So this is something which is so unique and so special. And it's the ability, frankly, again, to, you know, when you do something like this, think about it, your whole life, every single morning, when you get out of bed, there's meaning, there's purpose, because you saved a life, you gave someone life. I can't think of anything greater um, in terms of intellectual pursuits and accomplishing, you know, some of the greatest gifts to better the world and humanity uh, than, than what you're and the foundation are working on. Well, thank you. That that's um, a lot of a lot of goodwill coming out of you know this decision to be an organ donor, and we are so blessed to be a part of it and to play some you know uh, role in it. So, speaking of goodwill and charity, Bill, I wanted to address um, you know charity and goodwill, similar to seemingly every major religion really is based on morals, outstanding charity, goodwill, um, bettering others, um, and, and selfless acts. So within the Christian faith, you know, and talking about Christian values um, and way of life, um, it really, charity and goodwill really define those values. So can you speak more on the role that morality plays within the Christian faith and where organ donation falls within that discussion? Yeah, uh, so I spoke earlier about the, the primary and fundamental example of Jesus on the cross, giving himself for the life of the world. That's the perspective of Christians, so that Christians can be in full and complete relationship with each other and with God. So the charity side of this would be maintaining that relationship and that primary relationship with God, with self and with others in a communal aspect and doing everything we can to make sure that we do that. In the, uh, I'm an Episcopal priest, so in the Episcopal church, we have a baptismal covenant that we promise to God through our baptism, which we consider a, a, a spiritual birth. We promise to act uh, towards others. And the, the final one, uh, there's five promises. And the final one is that we promise to respect the dignity of every human being. And so charity comes out of that promise to see everyone with the dignity that God sees them. The spiritual practice for a Christian would be seeing the world through God's eyes. I mean, attempting to do that and attempting to love the world in that way. So charity is, is, is an attempt to um, let the love in our hearts, if you think of it, uh, overflow. Our, our, our hearts are not big enough to hold God's love. And so charity is the overflowing love from our hearts out into the world. And a profound way to do that 
is to offer our bodies. Now, most of us would offer when, you know, after our death, we're on the organ donation registry. And I've been on for decades. And so it's just a, a sense that our life is not lived alone. Thomas Merton wrote this book called No Person is an Island. We're all connected. And at the, at, when we go down to the grave and we have those funeral liturgies, we say there, life has changed, not ended. And so organ donation fits into that sense also, that there's a strange, wonderful, mystical embrace from God that continues after we die. And organ donation uh, is, is part of that, and it's a physical part of that. So Christian charity is caring for the world and reaching out in love that overflows from our hearts to make the world a better place for others. And we, uh, Jesus talked a lot about how we become who we most are by giving ourselves to others. And so organ donation can become a spiritual practice for Christians and, and a profound one at that. That's beautifully said. Yeah, um, I, it really um, touches on a lot of different aspects of the Christian faith. And, um, you know, it's, it's this overwhelming sort of commonality between major religions that I keep um, emphasizing is this charity, goodwill, um, doing good for others seems to be, you know, um, uh, the primary goal uh, as, you know, practicing members of, you know, their respective faiths. So um, thank you. Um, and moving sort of in a different direction now, I wanted to sort of open this up to be more of a roundtable discussion, um, starting with Rick, you know, we sort of talk about, we're talking a lot about organ donation and, you know, giving um, pieces of ourselves to others um, as acts of goodwill and charity. Um, speaking more on the transplant side, um, you know, what, if any, are sort of ethical, this ethical and spiritual guidelines, as you mentioned, you know, different time, this was not even a feasible reality for, you know, the writers of this, of these scriptures, but, you know, what are sort of, if any, are the ethical and spiritual guidelines surrounding the act of receiving a transplant or, you know, receiving even blood donation, et cetera? Great question. Um, I think it's really the same core values just turned around. The essential ethic at play is the celebration of life and the primacy of doing whatever we can to improve the quality of one's physical health in terms of one's life, and certainly to prolong life in the face of potential death. So anything that one can receive from another, be it blood or an organ, that is going to be beneficial for one's health. And obviously we have tremendous gratitude uh, and appreciation for all of the scientific breakthroughs and the medical knowledge that allows for us to be comfortable knowing, sure, there's a risk. Uh, my understanding is that we continue to significantly reduce those risks in terms of making sure that we have a good match and that other uh, mechanisms are in place to ensure that the recipient uh, doesn't reject the, the new organ. Um, those things could happen. Obviously, when medical professionals place before a patient and their family, look, here are your options. We can take this risk with tremendous benefit on that side of the cost benefit analysis versus do nothing and face the severe consequences of death uh, or you know, severely compromised life. Uh, if the medical professionals are urging, look, we really believe that you should be taking this calculated risk, this educated decision to move in the direction of something that continues to work, continues to prove successful, then our obligation, and Judaism stresses this throughout its various discussions across the centuries, that we trust medical expertise. We trust those 
who have our best interests in mind and have dedicated their lives to understanding how to make those calculated decisions. Uh, it's certainly not something that we can take lightly in terms of forcing somebody uh, on either side to give or to receive, but precisely what we're doing, what the Chris Kludkin Foundation is doing is to strongly encourage and to say with the enthusiasm that my co-panelists and I are saying today that our traditions highly stress the importance and the value of moving in the direction of, yes, receive. Judy, the, the, the Torah says you shall surely guard your soul. That's understood to mean to take care of your health and to do whatever you can to advance your own physical well being. And receiving a transplant, when doctors say that that is the indicated direction and response to take, that makes it a Jewish decision. Well said, very well said, yes. Um, Bill Mendel, if you guys have anything to add to the discussion, like I said, we're sort of gonna make these last couple questions more of a round table discussion. So if you guys wanted to chime in. I think uh, Mendel, I'll go first if you're, if you're okay with that. I think maybe from a Christian, one of the Christian perspectives, many Christians think differently, but if you think of the act of receiving a transplant and what are the ethical and spiritual guidelines? I think within my tradition and my practice, it would be looking at uh, the giftedness of life, that all life is a gift and received as a gift. And so if someone receives the gift of a transplant, I think the expectation would be that they would turn towards the world and offer themselves as a gift to the world. We talk about in the kingdom of God, Jesus talked all about the kingdom of God. It's all around us. We just have to tune our eyes to see it. In the kingdom of God, a gift always keeps moving. And so no one can hold a gift. It, it's the nature of a gift in God's kingdom to move and to be shared. So that the reception of a transplant uh, and a donation would be just that, a gift that is then shared. And, and uh, it could be used spiritually to really open up the kind of gratitude uh, that really awakens spiritual hearts. So that would be part of it for us, that there would be a receiving and then a turning. And that happens in any gift uh, in, in God's kingdom. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, uh, that, that's, again, well said, um, and a great point to make about sort of kind of reflecting on, you know, the circle of life in that in that sense, um, just how, you know, from one uh, many. Uh, so it's it's very, uh, it's a great perspective. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Mendel, if you have anything to add. Yes, uh, just to add to that, uh, really, I think it was so well articulated and said, uh, the uh, concept of being a recipient is such a gift and such a blessing. And most of us, or all of us certainly know, and certainly you at the foundation know firsthand, the feeling and the emotions that people have being a recipient, it's a new lease of life, uh, being cured of an illness or something one suffered or struggled with for an extended period is such a blessing. And uh, so there is no challenge there to the, to the country. It's encouraged. I've donated. I know it's uh, very basic and it's so easy, for instance, blood many times. And it was something that feels so rewarding knowing that it has the potential to, to give the gift of life to someone. But even further, uh, Judaism would say that when someone going to the point of being a recipient, that when someone becomes a recipient of such a gift, that would be similar to the concept where they have to make a celebration of gratitude known in the Hebrew as a se'uda toda, literally thanking God for celebrating the gift you had uh, and the blessings that came your way. So it would be throwing a party. I mean, it's, it's that big a deal from a spiritual perspective, not just getting smashed or something, but, you know, doing something so positive with it and sharing in the deep gratitude and in the delight and in the blessing and the gift of life. So none of us should ever need it. We should only be on, in a position to give 
uh, and and just to reiterate again, there is no greater gift. I mean, it's really, it's so counterintuitive because if you think about it, you're not really giving a gift to someone else. You're really giving a gift to yourself. Uh, it's something that's so meaningful that it's an act when it's done. And I, I know colleagues and friends and even family members that, you know, from kidney to other things, what they have done. And they just live, they, they have this sense of calm and peace around them. They, it's almost like, they, they accomplish their purpose and mission. It's a sense of fulfillment, a sense of inner joy, inner peace and contentment. And it's really, you learn, and we know this about life. When we give, we feel good about ourselves. Of course, the recipient has the benefit of what we did and the kindness and the acts of love and generosity and charity, whatever it may be. But really, it's, it's counterintuitive because we're the ones benefiting. We're the ones getting the blessing. And, and I think that's what's so unique here, especially in such a scenario. Yeah, again, well said. And I think there's, there's um, the celebration is really sort of a beautiful aspect of it, um, that it is a celebration, life is a celebration, and being able to give and receive it um, are both two very important things to celebrate. So a lot of times, you know, especially for transplant recipients, they're in, you know, the, these traumatic situations and organ donors as well and family members of organ donors, they're in these traumatic situations and they're not really seeing it. You know, I'm sick. I, you know, I, I got a transplant. I'm still going through recovery. I'm still in pain. But just the fact that here they are, you know, with a new lease on life, with this second chance and this gift that deserves a celebration. And I think it's really beautiful. Um, what, what you mentioned about the celebration of life, um, I think is sort of is can be a theme throughout, you know, throughout this webinar is just it is a celebration and it is truly a blessing. So thank you all for sharing those perspectives. Um, I, I wanted to ask one more question before we open up the floor to some Q&A. Um, so please, uh, any attendees who have any questions um, and would like to um, address, you know, one of our speakers, all of our speakers, myself, anything, um, please post in the Q&A box um, down at the bottom of your screen. Um, my last question to you all, um, just sort of digging a little deeper and getting a little bit personal here, but have any of you ever personally worked with somebody who has questions related to organ donation or to healthcare? You know, what's my, what's the best decision for me um, going forward in terms of, well, staying true to my faith and to myself. So was anybody that you've experienced in the past or helped uh, in the past, were they struggling with the decision to, you know, become an organ donor or to make a, a big decision regarding their health because of their faith yeah so i'll jump in there uh so it, it, it's a it's a wide range of questions so the at the lower end so to speak it's a question of what should i write on the back of my license or should i you know um is there any Jewish input there or what's the rules or traditions or laws? And that's probably a common question that I assume Rabbi Rick probably gets as well and the Reverend as well, because you know that's something that's in front of people on a daily or certainly annual, multi-annual basis whenever they renew a license or the like or take your kids in and so forth to get their IDs and the like. So that's obviously something you encourage and you know, and that's very basic because it's not an emotional element to it. Uh, but I've been in scenarios as late as just a couple of months, as recent as, excuse me, as just a couple of months ago, where somebody struggled uh, and it was a family member and they had a lot of concerns. And when it comes to fear and concerns, as we know, a lot of them are not rational. It's feelings people have and fears people have. And with a lot of love and empathy and good work and kindness. And with the support team, this person was able to have the courage to go ahead and do it and give someone that gift. So, and they have zero regret to the contrary. They're full of gratitude for having that opportunity. Thank God the donation went well, the recipient took it, there was no complications. So in all these concepts and in all these areas, I think uh, it's, it's, it's easy to encourage, frankly, and to obviously practice what we preach as well. Uh, but seeing that, you know, obviously there's an emotional element and a more lighter side to it. Wonderful, yeah, very well said. Um, Bill, Rick, anybody uh, want to chime in? I can, I can go, Rick, and then you can. Um, 
I think for us, a lot of those discussions in my tradition would be uh, to make sure your family understands because of the Episcopal Church has been very clear about encouraging or, organ donation and about sort of the, the theological reasons for it, uh, some of which I explained. So this would be on, on that side, on the donation side, it would be to understand the, the gift of life and that your family understands it. I've had the opportunity to work with a, a, transplant, a transplant recipient uh, with, he had a heart. And so just to see the profundity of his daily living with that gift and trying to transmit that to the other side, the donation side uh, is, is I think really important. I think people, you know, our roles are fine. We understand them. So people really understand the value of donation once they have a relationship that can show them that. And so I really appreciate what you all are doing with the Chris Kluge Foundation and just letting that be a, a, a normal positive example of how, uh, what an amazing gift this is for people and how they can live with that giftedness and, and to see that profundity is, is, is really life-changing. Yeah. I, um, beautiful. Yeah. I, I haven't um, had any situations where I've worked in any extensive way or had anyone come to me for guidance about an actual decision. Uh, what Mendel was saying about just general encouragement of people to make choices about uh, identifying as a donor on their license, things like that. Uh, I've had opportunities to speak in, in an encouraging way about those choices. Um, mostly, I think that the lack of any uh, specific interaction with somebody having any struggle is that I think that the Jewish community is doing a pretty darn good job of promoting the ideas we're talking about here. And that when push comes to shove and people need to make these decisions, uh, that they're not struggling with, well, what is the Jewish choice? They know what the Jewish choice is, uh, whether they've been identified as, as, as a donor, maybe someone in their family might need their kidney, um, or in the reverse in terms of going forward with receiving. Um, we certainly don't wanna let up, we wanna continue to promote, we wanna to continue to dispel misconceptions, but generally my understanding is that uh, that when people are facing life and death situations, be that for themselves or for an opportunity to make a positive impact that they know not only in their heart, but also if it's Jewish folks who care about a Jewish view, they know what the Jewish view is. Um, I'll push it uh, a little more personally. Um, I have several friends who have become kidney donors. And each time I see or hear them sharing about either going through the process, having made the decision or reflecting back, sharing pictures of the recipient and updates about the celebratory life uh, along the lines of what we've shared of that recipient who's moving forward with gratitude and living their life as a gift. Um, and, and, and then the joy, the ongoing joy, uh, you talk about a gift that keeps on giving, um, for the one who, who donated the kidney. Uh, so I can't help but ask myself, I'm a healthy man. I could probably do all right with one kidney as many of us can. What am I waiting for? Why don't I go and make an appointment and look into the possibility of my donating a kidney to someone who would be a match and who would benefit from it? Now, again, as we've said, we don't go and force people to make these decisions. It's a very personal decision to give, uh, certainly if you're still alive, as opposed to if something happens after you die and, and your organs can be used. Um, but uh, there is an idea that we've kind of alluded to, it's spelled out in the Jewish tradition that, uh, first of all, from Leviticus, uh, don't stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. Don't be present when there's suffering and choose to do nothing. 
take action. It's spelled out even more specifically in the Talmud where there's a teaching that one who can intervene within their own household to right a wrong and instead does nothing, that person is held liable for the wrongdoing that's, that is continuing to go on within their household. The same thing at the level of one's city and at the level of the world. If we have an opportunity to intervene and to change something for the better and we choose not to do so, then there's something that weighs on us. Now, again, to the point of having surgery and having a part of your body removed, uh, that might not be the same thing as you know, telling people to vote or something like that. Um, it's very personal. It's not something we can force, but it's something that gives me pause for what do I wish to do in terms of being able to participate in this life-giving act. Beautifully said. Yeah, I think I think it's very um, the the question of living donation also because it's so new scientifically and it's really gaining a lot of traction um, now, especially with social media and everything. That is also something that you know CKF has shifted our focus to looking at, and also important to touch upon um, in terms of uh, you know religious uh, religiously and how faith can play a part in that. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, and I think we, we're getting some questions now. So um, I am just going through the questions super quickly. Um, okay, so first up we have, um, do we have any for information about the, um, the LDS religion or the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormon Church? Um, I, I'm, I am happy to answer, but if, um, any of you would like to chime in if you know something that maybe I don't. Um, <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, I'll open the floor and if, if nobody has anything, I'm happy to answer, answer that question uh, for Megan. Um, but anybody? <laughs> All right, perfect. I'll take it over from here. So basically, um, from our research, what we've looked into is um, as we were talking about in, you know, pretty much as a common theme throughout the whole webinar, there's technological advances and questions of, you know, profound economic, ethical, moral, and religious dimensions have sort of arisen with uh, concern to organ transplantation. So um, there's a lot of, a lot of, um, with every religion, with these new scientific developments, um, it's important to uh, address and look at each one uh, from a lot of dimensions. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, the LDS church, uh, the Mormon church has not taken any official official position on organ transplants. Um, however, in their uh, scripture, um, in specifically Alma 4023, um, it's cited that whatever happens, so, so we're promised that every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Even a hair of the head shall not be lost. So there is some conflict with organ donation, but there's also, which is very common um, among major religions, there is a lot of um, a lot of writing speaking about, you know, um, uh, charity and goodwill and saving one life is the equivalent to saving the world, things, things of that nature. So um, there's, there's in Acts 3, 6 uh, in the Mormon scripture, um, there is sort of a situation where Peter and John encounter a lame beggar as the two apostles make their way into the temple. Uh, the lame man asked only for alms, but instead was healed. To the one in need, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. So it's very, there's, you know, very similar, as I said, a common thread that sort of goes through um, all major religions concerning um, goodwill and, and, and charity towards others, helping your fellow man. So I think there's still, although the church officially hasn't made any sort of stance or position with, with regards to organ transplants, I think it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's your decision, it's uh, your choice to become an organ donor, and it's how you interpret that writing and, and the word within your faith. So um, I, I hope that answers your question, Megan question, Megan, that's a good question. Um, just getting to some others. Um, 
uh, Doug has a question. Um, Obviously, we know the future is with our youth and increases in donated organs will grow if your youth are educated and encouraged to register. Can you talk about what your faiths, talking to the, um, the guest speakers, uh, what your faiths can be doing to help to encourage young people to educate them to register as donors and become advocates within their communities and circles? As far as I know, uh, and this goes back to my general observation that uh, the Jewish community continues to succeed at promoting the importance of organ donation. Uh, as far as I know, uh, these ideas are brought up in youth education and youth gatherings, especially going back to Mendel's point, it's something that uh, a, an emerging young adult uh, has to confront in a new way uh, as they get a driver's license and have that opportunity to indicate donor status on the license. And to my knowledge, um, that is something that is incorporated into youth gatherings and youth educational opportunities within much of the Jewish community and appreciate the emphasis. It's certainly something, again, where we don't wanna let up and we wanna make sure that we continue to impress upon each new generation, the importance of these values and how to put them into action. Yeah, I would just say the Episcopal Church has been pretty quiet on organ donation. I mean, in a, there's a, a statement from the general convention, so that's as strong as it can be, supporting organ donation. But I think the direct answer would be to talk more about it. And the driver's license is a perfect time to do that and sort of normalize it uh, as an example of how we live the giftedness of life. And I think that's true even outside of religion. Um, and that's really our mission at CKF is to make it more of a normal conversation. Um, as we've sort of discussed today, it is a morbid one. We're talking about death and in a lot of different faiths, death plays a pivotal role. You know, it's sort of what faith centers around. So um, it's really um, an important discussion to have, although it is a morbid one. Um, you know, it's, it's especially within faith communities. I think um, it's, it's important to open the door for these conversations um, because, you know, as we've talked about, they already are sort of talked about in faith um, today. So just making it a part of that discussion on death and dying and life after death and, and, um, and, you know, your relationship with God in terms of, you know, dying and moving on, um, just sort of talking about those and it, it sort of intertwining those ideals within that discussion, I think is important. Thank you guys for answering. Um, we have another question um, from uh, Chris. We have uh, thank you all for participating in this inspiring conversation. Um, so what suggestions would the three of you guys have from a religious teaching perspective to eliminate the weight today and ensure everyone that needs a transplant can get one? Hmm, the supply chain problem. Uh, you know, I, I I think our roles or what we, where we can be a positive influence is encouraging, making it mainstream, speaking about it, that it's not morbid, it's, it's life-giving, it's life-saving, it's so special, it's so unique, uh, it's so transformational, uh, it's a paradigm change for everything, for everyday life. And hopefully the medical community and, and foundations like your CC can then be there from the other side as well. And, you know, the logistical side, for lack of better words, and get people together and do it in a speedy manner where we can maximize as much as possible and so on. Uh, but from the medical side, obviously, my knowledge would be limited. Uh, and as Rick mentioned earlier, we follow and consult with doctors whenever we have a question. And so I would, I would, I would defer to that. 
Yeah, yeah, it's very important and, and sort of what we are encouraging with today's webinar is if you have any questions, like I said, it's it's very it's a very personal decision to become an organ donor. Um, it's uh, everyone is different. Everyone interprets their own faith and looks at their own faith differently. So it really is your choice at the end of the day and to make it more, um, you know, definitive for yourself and that you're comfortable in the decision that you end up making. We really encourage everyone to speak with their faith leaders um, with regards to how their spirituality uh, views organ do donation and how they can either become more comfortable with the idea or sort of learn more about it. I think it's really important to have those conversations and reach out to your faith leaders. Um, Thank you guys. And we have one more question here. Um, this is about the Islamic faith. So I'm not sure if anybody uh, our, of our guest speakers can answer this, but I'm actually happy to. Um, if anybody, before I, before I go into my spiel, if anybody has anything that they would like to add about the Islamic faith. Um, well, in addition to having heard from Ryan Harris about how uh, the at least within the Muslim American community that that there is uh, an effort to promote these same ideas and values that we're talking about. Uh, one thing I do know is that uh, a uh, teaching that you mentioned earlier, CC, uh, that um, is in the Talmud, uh, one who saves one life, it is as if they have saved the entire world. I do know that that same phrase, that same teaching does appear in, uh, in Muslim text. I can't remember offhand if it's in the Quran itself or if it's uh, part of the Hadith, but it is um, considered a Muslim teaching as well. Because as you said, Sisi, it is a universal concept uh, that we're likely to find people throughout all of humanity who embrace that idea that every human being is unique and holy and special and deserving of treatment of dignity and with of the utmost care. And that when we do save a life, there is a whole future, whether that person is yet to become a parent or not, that's the most literal understanding. You save a child, child grows up, has children, well, then you have a whole line there. But even without that being the case, just let's say from a spiritual perspective that we're saving the world when we save one life. And I know that that is uh, part of the Muslim perspective. You took the words right out of my mouth there, Rick. I, I was gonna, it was, it's from the Quran, um, those words, um, and I was gonna compare them to the Torah. Um, so basically um, the Quran does say that if anyone saves a life, it is as if he saves the lives of all humankind. So many Muslims interpret that verse to mean that donating one's organs is a blessed act. And actually um, the Muslim Law uh, Council in the UK in 1995 um, issued a, a religious, it's called a fatwa, a religious edict saying organ donation is permitted um, for, uh, for Muslims. Um, and obviously there are different sects of, of, of Islam and some are observe it a little more, you know, strictly and, um, but really it, it, it has received a lot of that edict has sort of received a lot of support from within the Muslim community. And um, really that sort of quote from from the Quran, if anyone saves a life, it is as if he saves the lives of all humankind. You know, we've talked about this commonality between uh, major religions. Um, you know, it's it's pretty amazing that we all share this sort of organ donation is really along the same line of charity, goodwill, saving others, doing good uh, by yourself for others. So um, obviously, like I said, um, Best, best advice would be to speak with your faith leaders, those who you're closest with within your church, um, just to make sure that you know, you're totally comfortable and that um, it, it sort of embraces what you see as your religion, what you um, want to observe toward your faith. 
but um, basically, and, and most recently, I wanted to add in 2020, um, uh, it sort of was written further within the Muslim faith that um, once again, evidencing the validity of the use of brainstem death, which actually is, you know, the qualification to be an, a deceased organ donor. That's the accepted definition of death for organ retrieval from an Islamic perspective. So great question. Um, and thank you for, for um, asking. Um, and and uh, I hope I answered everyone's questions today. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions I can I can take, I'm happy to answer or to direct to our um, to our speakers today. But I actually will just type very quickly. Um, well, I guess in the chat, I will just um, put my uh, email down here if anybody has any questions, as well as our uh, website. Um, and if the speakers would like to put their email addresses or the best um, ad address to get uh, in contact with them, please feel free to include that in the chat as well. Um, but if nobody else has any questions, um, I would just like to say, um, you know, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, it is a very sort of deep conversation and something that is not often talked about, especially in relation to religion. So the goal of this webinar really was to discuss religion and organ donation with the faith leaders and those within the transplant community. So um, like I said, if you have any questions that weren't addressed or answered in today's webinar, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and uh, we hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you to our guest speakers for joining us and for being here today.